Welcome to the Radical Brilliance Podcast with Arjuna Arda and brilliant guests from around the world who are contributing to the evolution of humanity. Today's guest is Daniel Schmachtenberger, who's going to talk to us about where good ideas come from. So here's your host, Arjuna Arda. Welcome back to the Radical Brilliance podcast. Today, my guest is once again Daniel Schmachtenberger. You heard from him earlier on in this podcast series, talking about how to become an agent of evolution. Today, we're going to talk about the mysterious conundrum of where do original thoughts come from? I love to dwell upon this with many of my guests because it's such a great mystery to recognize that just as quantum physics educates us, things arise out of no thing. Truly original things that are not just plastic imitations of something else, they arise out of nothing. Daniel has explored this from many different angles, from epistemology to learning systems to understanding the neuroscience to understanding how is it possible that we can innovate. It, it actually, science defies it because really the only thing we know about the brain is what comes in through the senses. So how can something arise in awareness that didn't first get there through the senses. Equally, we could ask ourselves, how do we dream at night? When you dream of something you've never experienced, how did that happen? It's very mysterious and strange. So please enjoy this conversation with Daniel Schmachterberger, one of the most brilliant minds alive today in my experience. He's dense and solid and real and really well-educated and articulate. Um, pay close attention and Daniel will guide us into the exploration of how original new ideas come into the world. Hey, Daniel. How are you? Good. Happy to be here. Yeah, happy to be with you. You know, I was reflecting upon what to talk about today and I, I wanted to tell you a little story which is actually my favorite story from all of the 450 interviews I did over the time leading up to Radical Brilliance. And it, this is a story involves Leonard Cohen, who is a mutual love of ours. One of the greatest blessings of my life was, was getting to know him. So to cut a long story short, after a lot of backwards and forwards, I ended up actually being able to do an interview with Leonard. Um, and I went to his house, and we sat at his, uh, his kitchen table, which was extremely much more modest than <laughs> where we're sitting today. This was like, and this was a, an upstairs apartment in the Wilshire district of L.A. Um, uh, you know, look, all the furniture looked like it had come from a, from a garage sale, you know. So we're sitting at his, at his quite beaten up uh, kitchen table which has just actually had two, two settings on it. You know, it's a table just small enough for two people to sit. And we started talking about 10 new songs. Do you remember that album that came out in 2002 that had Love, you know, love Itself and uh, um, I Am Not the One Who Loves, It's Love Who Seizes Me. And it was incredible. You know, usually if I buy an album, there's like one amazing song that I play over and over and over again and the rest just fades away. This album, 10 new songs, every single song is like perfect, you know. So I started saying to Leonard Cohen, I said, uh, I said, Leonard, this, this album is just like incredible. And his response was, oh yeah, well, you know. And I went, he had this kind of wry grin where half of his mouth would curl. Go, oh, well, no. And I said, no, no, Leonard, I mean, really, this, this is like, this is, this was beyond anything anyone's ever done. And he was, oh yeah. And this went on for quite a while. He wouldn't give in. And the more he the more he dismissed it as just another album, the more fervent, the more zealous I got that this was almost like scriptural, you know. So finally, after about half an hour, I won my battle with Leonard Cohen. And he, uh, 
he kind of relaxed humorously and said, yeah, he said, I guess, I guess you're right. Something did come through on that album, right? And <clears throat> I, I actually reprinted that whole dialogue in the book. And I felt it very significant, the language he used, because he didn't say I did anything. He said something came through on that album. And then we talked a little bit about how that album had come to be. And he explained to me why he was so hesitant to take any responsibility for it. Because he said, really, I just relaxed. I just got out of the way. And literally, I received. I received things that were ready formed. And then it was just a matter of jotting them down. So most of that album came, th came to him when he was at Mount Baldy Zen Center, which I think is somewhere out just, just east of LA. He spent a few years as a monk there. And um, during that time, fragments came to him, but they, they were received like gifts. And later he went back to LA and, and, and went into the studio, his own studio, and recorded everything. So that's really the, the pivotal point I wanted to start from, that so many people, I mean, Alex Ebert of Edward Chop, The Magnetic Zeros, and so many leaders in technology, people who've invented things, writers, so many people use this language of, yes, something came through. I didn't do it, it came through. So I'd like to unpack with you a little bit what that's all about. Yeah, it's a, it's a fun topic. Yeah. Um, it's a topic that I have also been... It's a topic that I've also been inspired by and um, thought about and explored and investigated a good bit. So I, I have some thoughts to share with you on it, and uh, I'm not sure that my conclusions are right, but they are my best thing. <laughs> but they're the, the best you've downloaded so far, right? <laughs> um, we'll get there. Hmm. Leonard Cohen's a great example. Because did he experience what f felt like it came through to him? Yes. Did it feel other than the self that he normally identifies with? Yes. But it came through the person, the nervous system, the vehicle that spent its whole life making and attuning itself to music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it does not similarly come through people who have not spent their whole life attuning themselves to music. And specifically, mm -hmm. it's different than what came through Mozart, who spent his life attuning himself to a different kind of a genre of music. Right. And which is also different than what comes through Einstein, who spends himself his life attuning himself to mathematics and who, physics. Who also incidentally talked about things coming through. The general theory of relativity came to him when he's in the bathtub. And yet people who don't have a background in math and physics don't get general relativity. Right. Totally. Yeah. And so then as we want to explore a little bit more, what is the actual phenomena that's occurring? Uh, it's a in in various kind of New Age or spiritual schools. There's this idea of a download, and the download might be like that. There is the Akashic records where all the knowledge and all the stuff is, or there is what Bucky Fuller called the design inspiring realm, where there is some kind of higher knowledge source, maybe a higher self or higher beings or something, where. I open myself at, to some kind of channel, radio transceiver type, and I'm receiving something from elsewhere. That's kind of the idea of a download, right? Like when I'm downloading something on the internet, I'm receiving information to my computer that was stored elsewhere previously through some kind of channel. Um, and incidentally, just to interject for a minute, it's a really good analogy about, about the computer because you have to have the bandwidth and you've got to have a computer with, you've got to have a computer that can play that file, right? If you haven't installed Adobe Flash Player 8, there's no point in downloading the, the, the file because it won't play. So it's actually a good analogy to, to what, what you were describing about. You have, to, you have to have put in your 10,000 hours to be worthy of the download. So there's this, yeah, there's this question of, am I refining myself to actually be able to be a radio receiver to this channel? Or is it actually better described by something other than download? So th th we'll play with this a little bit. Mm. I actually saw um, someone asked, it's a long time ago, and I might be remembering it off, but someone asked Eckhart Tolle this question, and he answered it beautifully. I believe he was sitting with the Dalai Lama at the time. And he said something to the effect of, uh, he said, when, yes, when you enter a kind of transcendental state, 
however you want to describe that transcendental state, increased capacity emerges as you emerge from that state. But it's still tied to capacities you brought into the transcendental state. Mm -hmm. So he said, when a great soccer player has a has a kick to make and he drops into kind of a state of presence first, he'll make the kick better than if he didn't. But Eckhart's like, I still wouldn't make the kick well no matter how deep my presence was. And I don't mm -hmm. think the Dalai Lama would either mm -hmm. because our muscles aren't trained to kick. Mm -hmm. And when Einstein would drop in, he'd come out with math and we've never come out with math. Mm -hmm. And it's not because we aren't entering transcendental states. It's because we aren't bringing math to those transcendental states. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so um, one way to think about it and I would say the way that I more tend to think of it is that it's more of an uploading than a downloading process. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to also say that there's only one phenomena. I'm open to the possibility that the idea that something comes from a source that is other than the, through a process that is other than the process we're normally used to in terms of conscious rational process, that there's maybe multiple different things that can be happening. But I'll at least describe one of the most common phenomena, I believe, is say we take a psychic or someone who does channeling and let's throw out the ones who know that they're being charlatans or the ones who are just narcissists and don't know they're being charlatans, but you know, whatever. And let's take the ones that a lot of people feel an authentic insightfulness from and try and explore the phenomena. In my early 20s, I did this. Uh, I, I did these studies because I I found authentic insightfulness beyond what made obvious sense that they would have known and checked that they didn't have like something in their ear that was whispering answers to them. I'm like, what is this? Hmm. And then wanted to test it in a kind of scientific framework and it didn't show up when I was testing it. So I said, hey, how do you get these answers? So I channeled the Pleiadians or Metatron or the Akashic Records or whatever it was. I said, okay, so do the Akashic Records have knowledge about, say, math? Yeah, totally, it's all there, or chemistry. I said, great, what's the highest math you ever learned as a person? And they would say something. And then I would ask a math question that that person had never heard. They didn't possibly know the answer, so it wasn't stored in their memory banks anywhere, even unconscious memory, but that has a very objectively true or false answer or chemistry question, or my social security number. And I would ask first, is this a reasonable thing to ask that channel source? And they go, sure. And the answer was reliably wrong every time. Yeah. And so it's easy for a skeptic to do that and then say it's all bunk, throw mm -hmm. it all out. Like they're obviously not downloading from some source of all knowledge because we can ask for very discrete things and we don't, we don't get the answer right more than statistically random. We pretty much don't ever if it's mm -hmm. those types of things. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't throw it all out. I did when I was 20-something. Mm -hmm. But as I explored more, I'm like, why is it then that when the person comes in and says two sentences, the person, the psychic, gets quiet and then comes and says, you're getting a divorce right now. And they're like, what the fuck? I'm getting a divorce. How did you know that? And that kind of phenomena actually does happen. And we can describe it as cold reading. But I'm saying that there's something other than conscious cold reading, right? The way that somebody in the FBI might be trained to cold read, what is your vocal pattern and intonation and eye movement and body language actually showing? I'm saying that our other than conscious mind can do that better than our conscious mind can, and it can be trained and developed. Mm -hmm. Can I sure. respond for a second? So, so there's a distinction I want to run by you. <clears throat> And what comes to mind right away, I just picked this arbitrarily, would be funerals, okay? You can, I believe, I've never done it, but I believe you can hire professional mourners for a funeral. These, you know, there's one 800 we cry for money right? You can hire people to come to a funeral in large numbers, they'll all dress in black and they will cry. And they will go through the motions necessary for a good funeral. And then you could have somebody who's been married to their spouse for 50 years, genuinely bereaved. Superficially, those things would look similar, but I think you and I would agree that the experience of genuine grieving can't be put into the same bucket as, a profession, as, as, as mourners on demand, you know? So I feel, I, I, this is you know, my gut, my suspicion, which is often all we've got to go on, that the world of professional channeling, however well-meaning it may be, 
I don't, I just instinctively don't feel like it's the same thing as when some, you know, when, when somebody like Einstein or, 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 or whoever is just innocently going about their day and based upon their readiness, it just suddenly goes, wow, where did that come from? But they're not without any intention to be, cha- without any language about channeling or downloading. It's just like, wow, this, you know, this thing just suddenly came clear. Now I've got to unpack it. So I'm wondering if these two phenomena of, of people who set themselves up as channels yeah. and these, these, these things we can hear about that happen quite spontaneous, if they really belong in the same conversation. Well, let's play with it. Let's keep unpacking it because um, I would offer that they might actually belong to a similar class of phenomena, at least some of them. Hmm. So again, uh, let's not take all people who charge money as a psychic in the same way, and obviously someone might not charge money, but let's take people that we would But still be identified as a channel. I'm a channel. I don't care. Hmm. Let's take people who, whether they describe what they're doing as channeling or being intuitive, they... Uh, share things with people that they don't know where they got that people end up feeling are insightful more than was obvious and that their own described process is believed as earnest isn't just conscious cold reading what I think is happening is let's say I'm someone who's really been interested in people my whole life since I was little and so I'm just watching people all the time and I'm paying a lot of attention to people, and my my cognitive space, my intuitive space, is just being filled with human dynamics a lot. Mm-hmm. Like Einstein's was physics, and like Leonard Cohen's was music, right? I'm taking people in, and so now I'm when I'm watching someone, I'm I'm really fully with them, paying attention on a lot of channels to their voice and to their body language and to lots of things. Now I'm not going to remember hardly any of it. I don't remember what you wore last time. But at some level, I was exposed to that information, right? So there's that possibility that that information is available. It's just not something that is consciously available on demand. So you come in, I'm a psychic, and you say three or four lines, and I say, okay, wait. And I am now I'm listening for my channel, whatever it is. But when I'm listening for the aliens or the angels or the Akashic Records or just being quiet and receptive... In all of them, I'm shutting off analyzing, going quiet and receptive. The hypothesis is that there is a different kind of neural process that occurs where conscious thinking has to be serial because we can really only think one thought at a time. So we have to say these pieces of data, these axioms, these logical steps, this conclusion. Other than conscious mind being able to process much more things at once can do a parallel process but conscious mind turning off, getting receptive, parallel process occurs, and I just take the gestalt of everything I got from you, run it across all the things that I've been exposed to and look for similarities, and it happens to be that there is a kind of similar pattern that pops up, kind of not because of a serial process, because of a parallel process. I'm like, are you getting a divorce? Because the eight other people that had similar things were all getting a divorce and I don't know where it came from but I get an intuition and aha that seems to have come from nowhere Mm. I'm saying so the idea is maybe it comes from a download right from the some outside source I'm offering it as the possibility of it an upload from deeper pattern analysis not as a conscious process Mm -hmm. but as an actual process Mm. that happens when someone has a lot of domain knowledge in a space Mm. and enters a state of increased coherence that allows a different kind of processing of that knowledge. Got it, okay, yeah. And so if I'm Einstein, and I'm working on the math of relativity, and I get to a place where I'm just stuck, and then I go and I just puff my pipe and look at the clouds and blank out, now what's happening is a different set of neural processes take all that I just input, contrast it with everything else that I had, and see if an insight comes. Then I get an uh aha. Mm. And I go back to the chalkboard and I start working again until I get stuck. And then I go back and puff my pipe. And there's this back and forth between serial and parallel processing. And I think that Einstein very intentionally uh, did that practice because he became aware that as soon as he got to a point of diminishing returns on the logical part, 
if you went and took a break, an insight would come. Yeah, and I think we, I think we, all of us, probably you and I, have had moments like that already today. You know, where you either alone or in discussion with other people, where you pursue something through the best of your faculties, and then just blah. And in giving up, something new reveals itself. If you're enjoying this podcast with Arjuna Arda and his radically brilliant guest, you might also enjoy our eight-week online group coaching program. It's an opportunity to go deep and get stable in practices that enhance your own brilliance. We only take 20 participants at a time, so in a small and intimate group, you can go through the whole Radical Brilliance cycle. You'll have an accountability partner in another brilliant aspirant from somewhere around the world. The eight-week coaching program involves eight one-hour webinars with Arjuna Arda and a group of other Radical Brilliance coaches. You'll also receive one 30-minute coaching session with your own personal coach every week and one 90-minute coaching session with Arjuna himself. It's the ideal opportunity to drop deep into yourself, into the source of your own creativity, and to get support for an entire eight weeks of mining your own radical brilliance and bringing it forth into a project or creation that can truly serve the future of humanity. Find out more at RadicalBrilliance.com and click on the Programs tab. So what I'd like to ask you is if so we've, we've now we've kind of we've, we've set up a bit of a parallel between the world of psychics, you know, who do this reading and the world of greatness. Of, I would say a tiny percentage of what happens in psychics that actually seems to be uh, the meaningful part. Legit. Yeah. So we, we've set up this parallel of, 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 a, of, of a legitimate psychic reading or, or psychic or channel and then. Parallel to that is these moments of greatness that propel forward the evolution of humanity. So I'm wondering if we could kind of now let the psychic thing go and just stay with the greatness together for a little while and just explore. Like, so when, when somebody brings something in, when something arrives fresh, a song that doesn't sound like any other song, you know, um, a technology that doesn't look like anything we've had before. I don't know what would be a recent example. Yeah, I guess actually maybe maybe the initiation the initiation of blockchain and the understanding of blockchain as an idea. I don't know that much. Do you, do you know much about the origins of blockchain? I mean, the, the, it, it was uh, what's the guy's name? The, the guy who we don't know who it is. It was, Satoshi. Yeah, yeah, Satoshi. Yeah. Uh, as I understand it, that wasn't really a modification of something else. It was it was really original thinking. Would that, would that be true? There's a big question on what original thinking is. Yeah, let's go there. there. There's, so first in terms of the parallel between those, it's just that they're both places where we can hear the term download. Right? And I'm offering that what is meaningful in those phenomena could be thought of as an upload. And the, the psychic, we just take off all the gibberish part and we say just intuitive people who've paid attention to people. Mm-hmm. So just like the scientist has paid attention to science, if I've paid a lot of attention to physics, I'll have a better intuition for physics because my intuition is a lot more primed. If I've paid a lot of attention to animals in the wilderness in a particular area, I'll, I'll have a better intuition when I walk around the wilderness. If I spend my life paying attention to humans, I'll just kind of make sense of stuff faster, better, because I have a lot more pattern recognition. So let's examine like a serial entrepreneur like, say, Steve Jobs, okay, who... Well, admittedly, I'm, I'm, I was going back to the first Max, but the icon-based uh, software on the first Max actually did come out of um, of the lab at Xerox, right? So, but let's take, for example, the way that he reinvented the phone and saw capacities for a phone that we never, no one had associated with a telephone. And he, he really conceived of the first smartphone, right? And then later the iPad, I mean, we didn't even know that... 
the, the, the iPad is famous because he managed to popularize something no one knew they needed, right? There was no demand for anything like that. He just created it. So what's going on there? I mean, we, we, we could look at multiple examples of innovators, but in a mind like that that keeps doing that over and over again, is that simply a matter of taking a lot of input, letting it just stay in a, in a sort of, let, letting it just stay in a, in a unconscious way, and then bing, out comes the product, or is there something else? Can we explain everything in terms of input or uploading that is delayed and then produced, or could there be something more? Yeah, so th I, would different. That, I would say this is an, an interesting and important question that I want people to hold as a question and not default to being too certain of an answer about. Yeah. But I'll share some, I'll share some thoughts about it. One of the questions on the topic of original thinking or creative thinking is, is there such a thing as original or is it all com combinatorics, right? Taking a number of ideas and combining them in a different way and so you get a new result through combinatorial process, but it was still dependent upon inputs. I would say dependent upon inputs, but not predictable from the inputs. And that's because it's the inputs plus the synergy of those that leads mm. to emergent properties that are that weren't found in those parts separately. And so if I take a look at Ford making the car from from buggies, like knew, nobody knew they wanted a car. But we knew we wanted transportation. We already had things with wheels. We knew that horses were kind of limiting. We knew that there was a lot of horse shit and whatever. So it wasn't totally out of nowhere. The same if I look at the computer from a typewriter. The same if I look at uh, an iPad from a laptop, right? It was like I'm taking some kinds of things that people find interesting and recombining ideas. But then combining them, it's like if a cell respirates even though none of the molecules that make it up on their own respirate. You're like, well, where does the respiration come from? Well, it doesn't come from any of the parts. It comes from the way all the parts come together has this emergent property of life with a bunch of molecules that we don't define as alive. And so it's, I think there's something to what we call creativity that is combinatoric, but then finding the right combinatorics where the synergy emerges and the emergent property is what we call the originality or the novel. Yeah, it's beautiful. So let's do a quick review of some of the pivotal moments in the, that we know about in recorded history. And, and let, let's test this out. So maybe we can take turns. You know, so, so as far as I can see, a super pivotal moment that changed not just astronomy, but a whole lot more was Copernicus, right? So prior to Copernicus, we, everybody thought that the, 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 the heavenly bodies went around the Earth. But the problem with that was that they were now completely chaotic. So it, it, it postulated a, a god with ADD, where things were going this way and that way, they up and down, left and right. And then Copernicus postulated, wait a minute, if in fact everything was going around the sun, then we, would actually, then we could actually make sense of the movement of all these bodies. So not only did that explain astronomy, but it actually allowed us to believe in some kind of organizing principle that was coherent, and that ushered in the Renaissance, basically. It ushered in a huge advancement in science and architecture and everything, because suddenly we could believe in a coherent universe. So let's. So Copernicus definitely was a, was a pivotal moment. It took until Galileo to prove it. I mean, it was pure postulation until Galileo. So how does Copernicus stand up to ingesting bits of data, waiting, out comes the result, versus going into an empty state and something come, and in other words, how does Copernicus stand up to uploading versus downloading? Sure. So if I, there's a couple different elements. There were a bunch of cultures before um, Copernicus in Europe that had postulated a heliocentric solar system. And so there's definitely a question if Copernicus had actually become aware of Eastern thought or really? other okay. systems thought on the topic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there were other people that were working in related areas. So uh, it could be taking some ideas and advancing them. But we could also easily imagine that he was the first person to think about that, even within his frame, even if other people thought about it somewhere else within his frame. 
but I don't have to take a download to say I'm taking a different perspective, right? Mm-hmm. This is, even by a rational process, I could say, all right, well, this model of explanation le- throws all these errors. I get all these kind of incongruencies, so then I have to keep adjusting why God is crazy to, to do this. Or, and he goes, is there any other explanation? And try on another explanation. Well, what if instead of, it seems like the sun is going around us, but what if we're going around the sun? Just, I don't need a download out of nowhere to just be able to run other rational hypotheses. Okay. And we can all do this kind of process of saying, is there another perspective I could take? Is there another hypothesis I could generate? Even if I've never heard that one before, I'm just going into perspective and hypothesis generation. And then some of them will yield interesting results. So when Einstein was thinking as a young person, like, so Galileo talked about being on a train, going at a fixed speed and things that happen, whatever. What if the train was going at the speed of light? What if it was a... Galileo talked about going on a train? Not at the speed of light, but yeah, he talked about inertial reference frames. But not train, right? Uh, Galileo talked about an inertial reference frame. Okay, okay. And so... Einstein was thinking about inertial reference frames. And then he's like, well, what would an inertial, what would the, as a thought experiment, what would the perspective be like if I'm riding on a light beam? Hmm. If to see requires light hitting my eyes, could I actually see something if the light could never catch up to me? So he's doing this thought experiment, but he's thinking about a reasonable thing, Mm -hmm. right? He's just taking the perspective of a light beam. Mm -hmm. So when you say, where does creative thinking come from? One place it comes from is taking other perspectives. Okay. And so taking the perspective of the sun could help Copernicus get good insights. Taking the perspective of a light beam could help Einstein get good insights, right? Um, So that's one kind of creative tool. You'll notice that taking the perspective of other people will help interpersonally, profoundly. Okay, got it. Yeah, great. And... Mm -hmm. Like, one of the things that I really want to do most of the time in personal relationships is say, before I talk, do I get the other person's perspective well enough that I can share it with them and they don't need to add anything? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, why do I even want to share my perspective when it might be totally wrong? It might be based on misunderstanding them completely, when if I really understand where they're coming from, I might have a completely different take on what I currently hold as my perspective. Let me ask you a question for a minute, because you just just spoke about innovation really arises from taking, trying on different perspectives and you then you contrasted that interpersonally with taking on the other person's perspective. What would happen if we postulated taking on the perspective of the whole? I think that this is important. You can't take on the perspective of the whole. You can only take on lots of perspectives. Okay. Because perspective... Right? The definition of a perspective is a frame of perception. It's a point of view, yeah. 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 And so, do I see this microphone right now? Well, I see a perspective on it, but I can't see what's on this side of it. I can't see what's underneath it. I can't see what a microscope's perspective would see. I can't see if I took it apart and looked at the inside. I can't see it the way that if I zoomed out and saw it in the context of the whole room. So am I really seeing it? Well, I'm seeing a perspective on it. But does that give me all the information about it? No. So perspectives are inherently reductions of information, right? The perspective on a thing has less information than the thing itself has. So, but what you're saying is if we took, if we could find a way to include multiple perspectives... I start to get a more holistic and never complete picture. Right. Now, how can we apply that to our current predicament historically, the place we are in history? Because... You know, we, we know, we know looking back that we've got five to 10,000 years of recorded history. We know from anthropology and from archaeology that we've got way longer than that, that we've, that we've been around somehow and that life has been around. And even though we're facing potential catastrophe, it seems, I think, intuitively feel something's going to survive, right? It may not be everything that we have in the way that it is right now, but something's going to continue. So, and that something that continues can be in a spectrum of well-being, you know, of, of, of catastrophe to pretty, pretty good survival. So, how can we apply taking multiple perspectives to the kind of thinking we need to create the best possible future? Yeah, I mean, 
it's both foundationally important and kind of obvious, right, when you set it up like that, yeah. is... So when we come back to saying no perspective on a thing is the thing, yeah. then what we get is that truth itself is trans-perspectival. And so every perspective has at least some truth in it. But like I'm looking at, I'm looking at this side of the microphone. The other side of the microphone might be painted different colors, right? It might have different symbols on it. And so we could get in an argument over what does the microphone look like. So we could get in an argument over what the microphone looks like or anything, right? What is the east side of the building versus the west side of the building? And we're both, there's truth in it. But I might have yellow glasses on, so the whole thing is distorted. I might have a fisheye lens on that distorts the whole thing. But that distorted view still has some truth quotient. I just have to be able to address the, for the distortion. So all perspective is at minimum partial, oftentimes partial and distorted, and yet still has some actual signal getting through. And yet the truth of the thing, what is the building actually like, can't be held in any of the perspectives. So then the question is, what is the minimum set of perspectives that I need to take? And how do I put the partial truth from those perspectives together? And how do I correct for distortion such that I start to actually get a larger understanding, but not picture of the whole? The moment I try and make it a picture, if I want to make a picture of what the building looks like that includes the inside and the outside and the east side and the west side, I can't make a picture, right? I would have to distort it and then the whole thing would be wrong. I can make a video tour, yeah. but now I've had to add the dimension of time to allow multiple perspectives, right? And so the, the desire to be able to get on the outside of reality, not be part of it and be able to see the whole thing at once is actually a bad idea. So how does... How does collaborative co-creation affect what you've just said? Because actually, theoretically, one person would be limited by what you've said. A group of people working together would reduce that limitation. Well, each pers person is going to have a perspective that might have some distortions, some truth, and some partiality. So then the question is, is there a process of conversation that we can go through that can... Now, if I'm... If I think that my perspective has no distortions, then I'm going to be limited in the type of conversation I can have with you. If I think my partial perspective isn't partial and it's the truth and the whole truth, I'm going to be very limited in the kind of conversation what we can do. But if I know that my perspective is partial and I'm open to the idea it might have a distortion I can't see, mm -hmm. and I'm also open to the idea that it might have something novel to add that others aren't seeing, now we can actually have a meaningful conversation if we're all in that place. Right, right. Then we can say, well... If some other people can see the same spots as me, at least parts of the same spots, and they and multiple of them aren't seeing the red that I'm seeing, maybe there's a distortion, how do we check it out? And if you're seeing something else over here, maybe there's a partiality, how do we sew those together? And this should be what the art of conversation is, which should be at the foundation of civics, right? Um, which is how, to, but first at the individual level, how do I make sure I'm sense-making well? How do I try and correct for perceptual distortions, biases, right? And how do I try and take as many perspectives within myself as I can? And how do I remove my identity from my perspective so that I can be transperspectival as opposed to being attached to an identity and an in-group that all shares that perspective, right? And then can I actually listen? to you and try that perspective on. Can I actually go and be in your spot, try that perspective on, try multiple on, and then be able to have a trans-perspectival frame. Not, not frame, a trans-perspectival relationship with reality that is not holdable in one frame. As you're listening to this conversation with Arjuna Arda and his radically brilliant guest, you might feel inspired to go deeper into your own expression of radical brilliance. Come join us for a one-week Radical Brilliance Laboratory held in a beautiful rural location in the Sierra Nevada mountains of California. During the laboratory, you'll have an opportunity to dive deeply into all four quadrants of the brilliant cycle. 
This means you'll be able to explore experiences of consciousness without boundaries. And you'll be able to start accessing original impulses of creativity from within yourself that can become your unique contribution to the world. You can get in touch with your own learning and integrate mistakes that will allow you to mature and grow. You'll have the chance to deeply mine your own resources as well as connect with other brilliant people in a small, intimate context for a week. You can check out the Radical Brilliance Laboratories at RadicalBrilliance.com under the Events tab. So and let's explore also, you, you've just you've just those questions very valuably, referencing uh, referencing can can I do that? But by definition, when we collaborate or when a group of people collaborate, each each individual has the opportunity to do exactly what you've just said. Right. So it's not just one person now seeing how many perspectives they can include. What happens when many people right. not only represent different perspectives, but all have the shared intention to become multi-perspective? So if we think about the way that our brain intakes information from our sensory organs, if I just have one eye, I can have distortions because where the optic nerve comes into my retina, there is actually a spot where light's not hitting. So my eye has to move back and forth to be able to kind of fill that in, but I can have distortions. And I don't have depth perception in a single eye. So I've got these two eyes, and they overlap what they can see, right? Mm -hmm. So that does a couple things. It gives me error correction because where there is a mistake in this one or where there's a hole in the light, this one will be able to see. And because I can now calculate the hypotenuse of the triangle between them, I get depth perception. And because I can see the difference in the periphery from this one and this one, I get uh, peripheral vision. So I don't have the left eye and the right eye in a debate with each other, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Arguing over who is right. They're completely collaborative. Yeah. They're completely collaborative in a way that gives error correction to both of them and then what we call parallax, mm -hmm. which is additional information that neither had on their own. Yeah. Neither had depth perception, neither had clear periphery. Mm -hmm. Now, then, so the brain's job is not to have them debate. It's to, and it's not just to add them together. It's to do this almost like magical, phenomenal process of being able to get rid of the distortions in both and then get new synergistic information that was contained in neither, but is contained in the contrast of them. That's one interesting thing about that analogy, because when you talk about two eyes, there are two eyes, and actually biologists say that it's more accurate to talk about the body as a community of cells than as, an, to, to talk about the body as a thing is really inaccurate, in the same way we're talking about you know, a crowd at a football game. It's not a thing, it's a collection of individuals. So, you know, we know this, that, that, that many of the cells in the body can, could, can exist and be transplanted. They, 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 are, they can exist in the autonomous of the body. So the eyes, each eye is like its own thing. But the interesting thing about that analogy is it's been governed by a single intelligence, right? You've referred to it as, they're not two brains, one operating each eye. Yeah. So how could we trans, how could we learn from that? In the same way like a beehive operates that way. Yeah. How can we posit a way of creating the future where something similar happens in the way that you and I could collaborate, but really with the experience of being governed by one intelligence that we, that we are both instruments of. Yeah. So let me give another example that will be important for how we do this. So now I've, I've got two eyes that are doing this for vision. I've got two ears that are doing a similar thing for hearing. And the sound waves are going to hit this ear first and then this ear later if the origin of the sound is coming from there. And so I can get uh, an awareness of where things are in the space based on the difference in the ears. And right? also be louder on one ear, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so now the brain has to run a parallax between the ears. But then I've also got between the ears and the eyes, which are totally different types of information, not just different mm -hmm. locations of a similar type of sensor. Mm -hmm. Because... I can see where something is and hear where it is. And if I get conflict between those, then 
we throw an error, right? I can hear something and turn around to see it to try and verify and get additional information. Mm -hmm. And so not only is the brain working on creating a, a unification, right? Rather than say a singular, I'll say there's a unifying process that creates continuity between the left eye and the right eye, left ear and the right ear, but also between the ears and the eyes, and also between the ears and the eyes and proprioception and smell and the internal sensing and external sensing and all of this stuff to create a coherent sense of self and a coherent sense of reality so that you know I can navigate. You know what I'm realizing as you speak is that actually there's another element that we haven't, I don't feel we've quite labeled coherently enough that we've got two ears, two eyes, a brain, but we've also got a, an incredibly complex high-speed communication mechanism between all of them. We've got neurons that are also an intrinsic part of that whole piece, so, which, which I guess would be analogous to highly effective communication between people. So if I look at the way the sense organs all get processed together to get a perspective on self and a perspective on the world that factors all of them, tries to factor the distortions and limits out of each, tries to give synergistic information across them that allows me to navigate the world well. I can see that this happens on so many levels. I can now, rather than look at the sense organs, I can look at the neurons and say each neuron is doing some information processing. But a whole neural network, or the brain as a whole, is doing synergistically more information processing than the sum of those neurons separately. Some of the neurons will actually get some wrong information processing. They'll throw some errors. The, and if those errors keep cascading, hmm. then we'll get major problems. So the brain has processes of error correction, where if one particular neuron throws some error, there are ways of being able to detect that, meaning... I'm getting information from this neuron over time, so I can contrast its signal this second versus a second ago and a second from now. I'm also getting information from other neurons nearby, right? And there's a way of being able to contrast all that so that I can get both error correction and parallax. Again, mm -hmm. information that exists only in the contrast of these different informations, not on any of them on their own. If we started to think about humans as sense organs or humans as neurons... And being able to say, we're all sensing something. We're all processing some information. Rather than debate with each other, or rather than say, we're processing such different types, we can't interact. We have to only interact with other specialists of our type, like eyes and ears not wanting to work together. Or mm -hmm. are we open to... Or the left and right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Our left eye. I, I don't go with you liberal types. <laughs> right. So is it... What if we said that we are inevitably, as individuals and as small groups and as whatever partial groups, affecting the other individuals and other groups and partial groups, we're affecting the whole, and we're inevitably being affected by the whole. Mm -hmm. And so if we could have better coordination with the whole, that would work out better for everybody. We can see war as a failure of coordination between the people on both sides to come up with a solution better than killing each other. Yeah. We can see environmental collapse as a failure of coordination between our current self and our future selves and our grandchildren where we're, where we're getting ahead today by doing things that are actually ruinous to our own future care. And incidentally, both war and uh, environmental degradation both have great analogies in the body. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Let's, I think it'd be a good idea to, if you don't mind, we can kind of start to, to bring this to, a, to a, a good conclusion by seeing, you know, we've, we've floated a lot of very useful ways of seeing things here. How can we wrap this up that becomes poignantly relevant to facing our predicaments as a race today? You know, we've, we've got, we've got big crises to face. We've got also incredible opportunities for evolution. So I get there's a, I, I'm hearing there's a lot of, there's a lot of things fairly near the surface in what you've said that we can apply to, um, to evolution, to conscious evolution. Let's see if we can, you know, um, we've talked about a number of things that are not the same thing, yeah. not the same mechanism. And so, um, you know, like the first point we're talking about uploading or downloading or and recognizing that the depth of experience we have and the depth of work and exposure and training in a field uh, through whatever mechanisms increases the kind of 
intuitive and insightful capacities in those fields. Then you say, well, knowing that, I'll kind of trust my intuition more in domains where I actually have a lot more domain knowledge. In other ones, I'll listen, but I'll check it. And in areas where I really want to have meaningful creativity, I'm willing to work at it. Like I'm willing to actually put the work in. And I'll recognize that if I've hit a diminishing response curve where I'm hitting my head against this thing, I'll see if I can go access quieter states. Mm -hmm. And then I'll see if I can get any insights and come back. So there's a whole set of insights around that process. But I think the most you know, important thing from this conversation relating to the world, and it's, I mean, it almost sounds trite, and yet it's so profoundly missing, is perspective taking and perspective seeking. Mm, yeah. I actually have a, there's a guy from the kind of integral philosophy world who uh, named Clint who was sharing with me a PhD dissertation he did a little while ago that was quite interesting. And, I know and, Clint, yeah. 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 He's an he's a interesting thinker. Uh, it's been kind of long held that higher stages of consciousness are associated with the capacity for perspective taking, the ability to have identity decoupled from perspective. And so as he was doing some kind of deeper study and analysis, the insight that he came from was it's actually not so much perspective taking ability as perspective seeking orientation. Right. It was a more active, not just I can take someone else's perspective competently, but that I'm actively doing it. I think this is hugely valuable. Yeah. And St. Francis says, seek more to understand than to be understood for so many reasons. Because the thing I wanted to be understood about, I find out was wrong once I understood the other side. I don't even want to be understood about it. Once I have understood the other side, what I have left to say is not only more clear and meaningful, but also there's more receptivity in the other person since I've heard them and they know that I get it and I care and I don't want to harm the things that they care about, right? Like for all those reasons, but also when you come to things, so this is key for if you want to, if you want to stop war, you have to actually have each of the sides be able to really get the come from of the other side to come up with a proposal that could actually work. Mm -hmm. If you want to get over left, right kind of polarization, you got to say, okay, as long as we keep making proposals that either benefit the economy and ruin the environment or help the environment and ruin the economy. We're screwed if we keep making dumb proposals like that mm -hmm. because they both matter. And when we put them in a theory of trade-offs, the people who are having the hardest time paying the bills can't be environmentalists. Mm -hmm. And the people who walk through the forest a lot and are doing all right financially don't get to care about your kids who have a hard time getting a job even though they would like to. Mm -hmm. So let's see if we can do a better job of rather than making the other guy an enemy because he's trying to harm the thing you care about because it was a dumb proposal to begin with based on a theory of trade-offs. Can we at least get their perspective to be like, oh, shit, that perspective also has truth that matters. I need to come up with a proposition that factors what is meaningful from that perspective, too. Where I'm hearing that everything we've talked about today, from the downloading all the way through to the, to the widening of perspective, what all of that has in common is actually unvelcroing to some degree from the grip of what you thought you knew to be true. Because the, 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 the downloading that we talked about actually requires you to take a break from being knowledgeable and to enter into, enter into a more kind of spacious state, which is where often this kind of downloading experience happens. But equally, being open to other perspectives relies, requires you yeah. to release your grip on where you thought you knew, where you thought you had all the answers. Completely. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's actually really um, such a valuable insight that... If I'm wanting a solution that I don't currently know, it's not going to come from rerunning the set of things I already think I know. Right. If I'm wanting anything that is actually creative or actually innovative, hmm. what that means is that it's, it's not just the thing that I already had, right? Yeah. And so there's a place of being able to, as you said, enter into where new solutions might exist that I don't already have. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I was just laughing when you were speaking because it's... You know, sometimes when you hear somebody speak in a generalized way, you, you, you illustrate it. And I was just remembering the times when, you know, I've lost my car keys or something, and I go look in the places it might be. And when I can't find it, I go look in those places again. Yeah. Two or three times. Instead of looking in new places, yeah. I go back and look in the places I've already looked. Thanks a lot for uh, hanging out today. I feel like, you know, it's... Uh, what I really love about talking with you is... Um, I see how you have the wisdom to stay in the exploration more than the a place of arrival. 
and that I find that incredibly refreshing, and and uh, it, it makes it makes these conversations really alive, and uh, and like we're you know we're like we're really at the frontiers, uh, instead of sitting comfortably in the living room of our already populated area. Totally. Thanks a lot, man. Thank you. It was fun. Wow, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Daniel Schmachtenberger as much as I always enjoy hanging out with him. I'm going to ask you to reflect a little bit on this conversation. It's always helpful when we can move from passivity in listening to a podcast into co-creativity where we, we, we make it real for ourselves. So I'm going to ask you in the light of this conversation to reflect upon your own experience. Think about the last time something completely original came into your mind that you'd never thought before. What was it preceded by? The last time you thought a thought that had never been thought before or said something that had never been said before, how did that come into your awareness? Where did it arise from? And what was the fertile soil in which that took place? Everything that Daniel shared with us today came from his exploration of his own experience. I want to invite you to do the same and to learn something from your own experience about original creativity. Thanks so much for being my guest on this podcast, and I look forward to catching up with you next time.